I'm Cody Daigle Oriens, and welcome to StoryFest 2020. Due to the ongoing impacts of the coronavirus pandemic, StoryFest 2020 is going virtual. From September 15th through September 29th, StoryFest will premiere 13 live and pre recorded author events featuring top authors and creators in genre fiction, comics, young adult fiction, and middle grade fiction. This year, we have over 50 authors joining us from all across the country, and in cross-genre panels, they will explore the big ideas at the heart of telling stories in today's world. Even though we can't welcome you to the Libraries Forum in person, we're glad to have you with us virtually. Thanks for being here, and enjoy StoryFest 2020. Kelly Jo Ford is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. She is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Paris Review's Plimpton Prize, the Everett Southwest Literary Award, the Catherine Bakeless Nason Award at Breadloaf, a National Artist Fellowship by the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, and Adobe Paisano Fellowship. Crooked Hallelujah is her debut novel. Jessica Guess is a writer and English teacher who hails from Fort Lauderdale. She is the founder of the website Black Girl's Guide to Horror, where she examines horror movies in terms of quality and intersectionality. Her debut novella, Cirque Berserk, was released this year. Alma Katsu's most recent book is The Deep, a ghostly reimagining of the sinking of the Titanic. Her previous novel, The Hunger, a retelling of the story of the Donner Party, made NPR's list of the 100 best horror stories, was nominated for the Stoker Award for Best Novel, and won Spain's prestigious Kelvin 505 Award for Best Novel. Martha Hall Kelly is the New York Times best-selling author of Lilac Girls and Lost Roses, novels about the incredible family of Caroline Faraday, a Bethlehem, Connecticut resident. Martha, a Massachusetts native, spends her days filling legal pads with Civil War scenes for her third novel, Sunflower Sisters. Nina Sankovich is a best-selling author, avid historian, and voracious reader. In addition to being profiled in the New York Times twice, she has written for the New York Times, the LA Times, Vogue, the Huffington Post, and other media. She is the author of four books of nonfiction, and her book American Rebels was released this year. Lauren Willig is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of 20 works of historical fiction, including The Summer Country, The Ashford Affair, and The English Wife, as well as the Rita Award-winning Pink Carnation series. So the authors on tonight's panel represent a wide spectrum of genre, historical fiction, literary fiction, horror, and nonfiction. Um, but all of you share a common thread, looking to the past in one way or another to find inspiration for the stories to tell. So. I'd love to start with uh, a question for everybody. Um, why history and what about the past inspires you and your work? I should have said who should start. Let's start with Lauren. <laughs> okay, me? Okay, well, I always wanted to live in another century. And since no one was willing to give me a time machine and a crinoline, the best <laughs> I could do was reading and writing a lot of historical fiction. And you know, I, I find I love being a historical dilettante. I did professional history at one point in my life, but you're expected to focus very narrowly. And part of the joy of historical fiction for me is you get to hop around to a bunch of different historical times and live in them through the eyes of other people. And so for me, it's a deeply personal experience. And I wish I had something more deep to say about, but I really, I just love living in the past. And how about Martha? Oh. I never loved history in school. Oh. I, I actually really uh, actively didn't like it. And, but I discovered a story just, you know, I started writing about five years ago or 10 years ago, really. And um, it was that story that made me want to dig into history. And ever since I started doing that, I realized I really did love history. Um, like I always have loved old houses, but I just never loved history the way it was taught in school. But now, now I'm way into it. Kelly Jo? Um, you know, I feel like I sort of accidentally wrote a book that um, goes, <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of historical fiction. Um, you know, I wrote the more contemporary stories first, 
Um, and I just needed to follow the characters' lives. And eventually that ended up taking me back to the origin story, what I think of as the origin story of one of the main characters, which took us to 1974. So it just kind of accidentally happened. And honestly, it, I feel like it sort of happens, like you, you look up and one day you're 40, you know, and you're looking at these pictures of your childhood and they're, they're tented in ways that seem like they shouldn't be and the cars look ancient. And so it didn't, it didn't feel like I was really going back, you know, um, it felt like I was very, it, it felt very present to me. And maybe that's just because it's kind of the era I grew up in. And, and also because I think I was just really character focused and, and just following them where it felt like the story needed to go. Jessica? Well, for me, uh, there were two main reasons why for this particular book, I decided to like play with history and stuff like that. But um, one was that I was answering a, a query um, or like a call to submission. And they specifically wanted um, horror stories like to take place within like the 80s, 70s, 80s and 90s or something like that. Uh, and I already had that idea, but it was like, I feel like for me, my favorite horror movies came from that, like that era and like slashers and stuff like that. And then also I feel like I can do more thorough research when it is something historical, when it's something that's already like, there's some reflective distance. There's some stuff that you can look at and know the context of what's happening already. Whereas like in the present, because you're living in it, it's hard to like have that distance. Like even what's going on right now, it's hard to like look at it you know, from like, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for with like, I don't know, good eyes, you know, cause you're so deep into it. So for me, that's what history kind of allows you to do. It's like you, you get to look at a scenario or a time with like um, balanced eyes. Nina? Um, well, I write nonfiction. So I write true history. <laughs> Um, and listening to everyone else's responses, everyone, uh, it all made sense to me. They, these are all reasons that I can actually identify with, although I did like history from a very early age. Um, I, was, I think I was just lucky enough um, in high school to have really great teachers of history, American history and European history, and I knew that's what I would go on to study. Um, but so many of the books that I read in high school and then as a history major and then um, through my life um, were not really, I didn't find them all that interesting to read. Um, and I love fiction and I love historical fiction. I love historical mysteries. So I really wanted to be able to write history in a way that was interesting. Um, and I really agree with a lot of what Jessica said, which is that having that distance really allows you to see events and Speaking to that, and so the 70s wouldn't work for me because I like to deal with eras where everybody's dead. I don't want to deal with any living people at all in doing my research. I want dead people. Um, and so I go, I went far, you know, far back. I go far back um, in my books. And um, for me, history just has so many answers for how we're living today. I mean, when I think about what we are going through right now, um, not even not even the pandemic, and there's plenty of history on that, but just politically what we're going through. Um, so much of this was um, anticipated in a horrible, like anticipated as the worst thing that could happen um, by people who, who really formed our nation in the you know, 1700s. And um, they did everything that they thought they could do to protect against what's happening now, and boom, it's happening. So it's just interesting that to, um, to see how relevant history is to what we're going through today. And, that, and that's why I love history and I love writing about it, but I wanna write about it in a way where it's like a novel, a mystery, a horror that you wanna just, you can't stop reading it. You, know, you just wanna keep going. And I'm not. Well, first I have to get over the thought that the 70s, 80s and 90s are considered <laughs> historic. <laughs> <laughs> my first, having lived through them as an adult. But um, <laughs> it's funny, if you would ask me if I had been a fan of history when I was in school, back in the slate and chalk days, um, 
I would have said no, but, but thinking about it, I've always been drawn to historical stories. And it made me, because the stories that I read uh, were often, you know, set at the turn of the century. And by that, I mean the last century. Um, uh, you know, the Victorian era and that sort of thing in the Gilded Age. I really enjoyed reading stories in those eras. So once you, you um, start thinking of your, you know, that I can write stories, I think it's very natural to be sort of mimetic and to try to mimic the stories that, that you really enjoy. So all of my five novels have some historic aspect to it, even if they're not wholly set in um in a historic period the first three you know kind of dipped in and out all you know many time frames it's it's um you know your opportunity to just do what you want to be a god almost right and form your own world and live the kind of life you want to have i think that's really the draw of writing historical fiction i gotta say as a as a former textbook editor you guys are my heroes because i had the same experience of the just the dry everything and and the storyteller of history like that that's what got me um obviously interested in in different topics so uh, and just based on what everyone just said i have about 10 follow-up questions but before i get to that those uh just another uh very broad question that i know is probably pretty difficult to answer and i'm sure you get it all the time uh so but when you're looking to write about the past in whatever form it is um where does the idea typically come from does it start with the time period uh, and maybe a sense of nostalgia, or in the case of the Titanic, um, like a, this, you know that there's this deep obsession from Titanic fans and, and, and followers, right? Uh, or, or does it start with the story the, and the characters, and then you kind of look to put those characters into a time period, or is it a combination of both, or none of the above? Um, then whoever wants to start, go ahead. Well, since you raised the Titanic, why don't I just go ahead and jump in? Sure. So usually for my stories, it is, um, you know, a particular period draws me to it. And, uh, you know, I have a rough idea of the kind of story I want to write, so I know the kind of characters that I need. So usually it has to be sort of like a happy marriage between the two. But The Deep, my last book, and I'm going to do a shameless promotion right now, mm -hmm. um, is about the sinking of the Titanic and its sister ship, the Britannic. And that was a little different because... Um, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. My last book, The Hunger, you know, I was super lucky. It was a very successful book. And so then when that happens, your publisher turns to you and says, okay, what's the next book going to be about? And, you know, now it had to be a disaster. And very shortly, I was seeing I was going to be like the Irwin Allen of novels, of present day novels, where I have to just come up with one disaster after another. Well, what's the biggest disaster, you know, you can think of besides the Titanic? So it kind of had to be that. I had no idea that there was a sister ship to the to the Titanic. I wasn't a big Titanic junkie. Um, and I just kind of stumbled across the fact that there was a sister ship that also sank and that there was a woman who was on board both ships when they sank and she survived both sinkings. So that was the impetus there, but that's certainly not how it usually happens for me. Well, for, I'll go. for me as a historian, I'm definitely looking at a certain event. I'm trying to, um, you know, figure out why something happened in history. And, um, and often I'm trying to figure out the question, like, why did this happen, for example? I mean, why, my last book, it was why did loyal subjects of England decide to rebel against, against England? And I think that in high school, we are sort of taught, it just, of course it happened, everybody agreed, time to rebel, let's go. And it wasn't at all like that. It was a wrenching decision that every colonist had to make for themselves. Um, so it was me trying to find the answer to that question. Um, and now one of the questions that I'm looking at is that, you know, there was a really strong anti-slavery movement in, especially in the New England area in the 1700s. Why did it fail? Why did they fail? to force you know, the, the Continental Congress to do the right thing with the Declaration of Independence. What happened? I mean, so again, so I'm trying to answer that question. So I have to go deep into history to figure out why that happened. So for me, it's often answering a question that gets me started. Yeah, same, similar here. You know, it's funny, when I was in grad school, my advisor used to always tell us to look for the gaps in the historiography to find out where there's something missing. I find it's the same way with a story grabbing you, that it's something missing. It's something that doesn't make sense, that catches your attention. And you think, wow, how do you explain this? Um, you know, For example, my last book, which took place in colonial Barbados, 
it was um, the whole thing started when I heard a story about a child who was being passed off as the Portuguese ward of a slave owner, but was of course his child by an enslaved woman. And I wanted to know who her mother was and where her mother was and if her mother had colluded in this deception or if the child had been wrenched from her. And the person doing the plantation tour couldn't tell me. And I couldn't stop thinking about that absence, that missing mother. Who was she? What would her life have been? What brought these people to this moment? And that's how stories form for me. There is that, there's that hole in the middle and things start spinning around like a chrysalis. And the next thing you know, you have characters forming. Or you know, similarly, the book I just finished writing started because I found out randomly that there were a bunch of Smith alums in the psalm during world war one right at the front lines throwing christmas parties for french villagers <laughs> and i couldn't figure out what a group of american college women would be doing in the psalm literally miles from the trenches throwing christmas parties it was just bizarre and so it's that what are they doing throwing christmas parties in the psalm it, it suddenly led to a whole book and for me that's pretty much how every single one of my books has happened that there is a sort of historical mystery or question and you start digging into the archives and digging into the sources and the people and the situations emerge out of that. Um, or, I can, or Kelly, sorry, go oh, ahead. Okay, um, I, can, I can hop in and I, I guess like it's fascinating hearing you all talk and it feels really inspiring and it, it, I've, I've written one book and I feel like it's, it was a very personal book um, it's fiction, but it's um, a lot of the bones of the story are drawn from my personal experience, which is why, you know, it didn't feel like I had to do a lot of research for an era because it was sort of, you know, my eras. Um, but I feel like for my next book, I, I would love, love to just step off into these questions and, and lose myself into research. Um, for this one, I, I feel like um, although my characters are, are fictional and they get to make up their own they get to make their own mistakes and have their own adventures and, and all of that. Um, they were very much inspired by who and where I came from. Um, the book's about um, four generations of Cherokee women um, and uh, mothers and daughters. And, you know, for a time when I was a little girl, I lived in a household with my great grandmother, my grandmother my mother and me and some of my mom's sisters or maybe some cousins, you know, and we were in the Cherokee nation. And so I was just, I was pulling from that. And I sort of had like, I, I it felt like I was, there was like a propulsion to sort of like tell the story of these women who came from these places that I, I came from. Um, so it was just very personal and there, there was, there was research involved. Um, but I, I feel, I always feel like there, there could be more because I feel like so much story as you all were talking, like um, Lauren, as you were just describing, I feel like so much story comes from research. You know, there are so many unexplored avenues because every time I, I lose myself in research of something like, um, I have a story about a mule in the book. I've never really been around mules, a little. <laughs> you know, I did grow up in Texas, but not much. You know, but I, I did so much research on a mule, you know, and that, that led to a story to unexpected places. So I think there's so much opportunity there. It's a lot of fun, um, but it, it's still pretty new to me. I guess I can go next. Um, I, I so agree with what Lauren said about curiosity. I, I do think that for all of us, it's all about, you know, it's so hard to write a book if you don't have that kind of driving curiosity, but I stumbled on a true story. That's how I wrote my first book, um, Lilac Girl. So I didn't really have a choice in a way. It was uh, a true story that happened during World War II. I, I don't know if I would have chosen to write about World War II if, if it hadn't been that story. I'm, I'm glad I did because it seemed like people were interested in it, but uh, so the next two I wrote were sequels, so I, had, I didn't really, I guess I had a choice, but in a way I didn't, so it went back in time to World War One and then to the Civil War, which was amazing. Oh my God, the Civil War, uh, that comes out next spring, but um, I, once I got into that glide path, I didn't have a choice, but for my fourth book, which I just um, started writing and um, was just acquired like six months ago, I, I'm doing something completely different, because I just thought, uh, and, and my agent thought so too, that I can't just keep doing this, you know, going back in time with this one family. Um, cause I think I would have ended up 
in like the revolutionary period or something. So I, I had to, you know, go with something completely different and it's more of like a, a thriller. Um, but that too is, it's set in the Cold War, so it's still historical. But anyway, so that, that was my journey. And Jessica? Yeah, so for me, it usually starts with the character more so. Like I get like an image of the character and then usually, I don't know if it's just my brain, but I put them in whatever era I think best suits whatever I saw them doing, right? Because I, I do write fiction and stuff. And like I said, because with history, you have more like context. I think maybe that's why I put them in, in these places. Like I too, I only have like one pu published book, but almost all of my stories that I've ever written take place in the past, right? Um, some of them are in the past in Jamaica where it, I wasn't there. <laughs> like I was born here, but my parents and my family, because they're, they're all from Jamaica and because I've heard all of these stories since I was young, I almost have an image of it in my, in my head that I like put some of these people in um, just because like they just come to me and I'm like, oh no, I, it's like I see where they are and I'm like, oh, that's definitely Jamaica or something like that. For this story, I got this image and it was in Jamaica, it was in Florida, but I, just of what, what I saw going on, I was like, this is definitely 80s. Like, and then I went from there. So it just felt um, true. I just go with whatever feels true. Like I try and look and see what are they doing? What era does this kind of match? And like I said, just because I have the context of some of these eras and stuff like that, and with research, I try and just find what, what fits them. So, yeah. So I guess, I mean, it's, it's a cliche to say that we are living through history, but we are definitely living through a very something piece of history right now. Um, and I wonder, going back to something, Jessica, you said earlier about looking at a thing with good eyes, right? So um, I, I've noticed that, that our, uh, some of the panels we've done, we've ended with 2020 pandemic questions. So I want to flip that script and talk about them now because our panels tend to get pretty depressing when we do that. But really looking at, looking at this year and the pandemic and just everything about this year with, with good eyes. So my question to all of you is, uh, in, in the last five months especially, maybe while doing research for a book or looking at past events or trying to figure out what the next book is, um, is there some insight that maybe you've learned or maybe understood or interpreted differently now that we can look at, we can look through things with the lens of, you know, August, late August, 2020? Uh, I'm wondering if, if the past seems different or you've learned something, taken something different from the past because of where we are now. Well, it's funny, my, my last book, The Summer Country, involves a cholera epidemic. And when I was writing it, I really strongly felt that epidemics were this quaint thing of the past, that we could write about them and imagine how these people felt in their time, but it wasn't something we were personally going to experience. And in retrospect, I felt really quite smug reading about how these characters in 1854 reacted to their pandemic and the kinds of crazy remedies and solutions they were coming up with on the fly because of course they didn't have the science we have now or even that they had like two years after that particular pandemic and then our pandemic happened and i found there were memes and things circulating on the internet with remedies that were crazier than than any bajan victorian had tried during their 1854 cholera epidemic I mean, drinking bleach for heaven's sake. And, you know, it definitely, it emphasized for me how, how far we are embedded in our own time, our own moment of history, and how we can't assume that we are at all superior to the people in the past, that, you know, we don't have that hindsight yet, that we have to earn it the same grueling way they did. On the other hand, because that sounds really depressing, my strangely <laughs> takeaway is, you know, while I was in early lockdown here in New York with the sirens blaring, I was finishing my book about the Smith College Relief Unit in World War I. And it was based really closely off letters these women had written home from the Psalm. And there was one that, and it was, you know, the end of March and things were really grim here in New York. And I read this letter that said something, they, I paraphrase, but it said something along the lines of, you know, it's, it's amazing how wonderful people are when 
in a great crisis when all the external barriers are broken down. And it spoke to me so much in that moment because there we were stripped to the bone with this pandemic and people were rising to the occasion and being that wonderful with all the external barriers broken down. It made me feel better knowing that the Smith women had gotten through their time in the Psalm, mm -hmm. that World War I had eventually ended, and that at some point this will end for us too. And people will be writing about this a hundred years from now, thinking we're very quaint and ignorant. <laughs> well, I think that having the pandemic and being in my house, I've now been here you know, since March, um, most of the time with my parents and four of my kids and my husband, and we've had every meal together and we do everything together. And I think I've gotten a real sense of what it was like for most of history to live with your family in a place. That's what you did. You lived with them. They stayed, they were with you from, you know, the time you were born till the time you were dead. Um, and you had all your meals together and you were isolated usually, you know, especially if you were, you know, in a smaller community, you lived, um, you lived in your village, you did your work. I mean, you look, um, even Abigail, you know, to look at Abigail Adams, someone we all know, you know, she spent so much of her life in this little village of Braintree, um, especially her, you know, her early, early life and um, before John became president and all that, but they, she did. And she was totally responsible for all the, for so, for people in her family, people in the village, people who would come and stay with her. And that's what she did day after day after day. She didn't like say, okay, tonight we're ordering in, you know, tonight we're, it was, it was an isolated and mutually dependent life. And I think I'm getting a real sense of what that actually means. And I didn't have that before I was forced to live it. I sort of think of, <laughs> Jessica, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say that, like, that it's been something that I've been thinking about for, like, um, stories, because there was a story that I was going to try and put in 2020 before this whole thing happened. <laughs> And then, like, it happened, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I need to go way back again or, or to the future, but I'm like, well, I don't know what that even looks like yet. And so, I don't know, like, for me, I'm still waiting. I'm, I'm almost, like, waiting for a cutoff period or something like that to know that, okay, I can talk about 2020 like this. I can talk about the pandemic like this. I can talk about it like this, because, like, like I said, I try to have that kind of reflective distance when I'm talking about something um, or an era. And I feel like right now there's still stuff in it. Right now, my, my question is, do I even write anything set in 2020 right now? Like, will I ever approach that? I think for right now, the question is probably not until I feel like there's only one thing I think I might still put in 2020, but even that, I, I'm almost just like, is that insensitive, um, you know, to things? Uh, so I don't know, I, I'm still kind of like struggling with that question because I do want to have good eyes when I talk about it and, and do a lot of research and it just feels like we're still right in the middle. So I'm, I'm still kind of like contemplating that right now. Can and will we want to just forget it is another question for you like will we want to just forget right. this i, I want to i want to get back to the 2020 question because that is actually my next question but okay. kelly you go and then and... yeah i mean i um my so my book is really grounded in literary realism throughout most of the book and and at the end spoiler alert <laughs> things take a bit of an apocalyptic turn and um I think perhaps if you were reading that pre now, like you might wonder, oh, is this like, was this really grounded into, into the, the previous events? I would say yes, but <laughs> nonetheless, um, you know, but, but so this idea that we're living our lives and suddenly things look much differently, I, I feel like um, feels, feels really, really relevant and and you know and we're dealing with questions right now of you know my my closest family well you know my my immediate family is here in my house but my parents are in texas um 
you know, and we haven't seen them. And, you know, my, my daughter, that's sort of is, she's an only child. And that's the highlight of her summer is to go to Texas and be on with the horses and drive the mule, not the animal, the little ATV thing. Um, but, you know, and so those are questions that the characters in, in the book are dealing with. Um, and I suppose it's, it's not history because that is set in the near future. I just didn't really have a sense that the near future, these kind of questions would be, you know, so, so feel, feel so heavy and important now, you know. Yeah, I just finished a, um, a Civil War book and um, I expected to be writing about the whole, um, you know, our, our country's so split. And I figured that would be a huge theme of the book and just like the Civil War. But what I didn't expect to just kind of blow my mind was how everything with Black Lives Matter was happening while I was doing my final copy edits. And I just, it, it, it was unbelievable to see that we, we really haven't come that far in our country. And it was just, it, 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 it was really interesting, but really painful to see that because you would think that since the 1860s, um, you know, with the end of slavery after the war, that things would have, have you know, would be so much better now. And I feel like, it's, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, probably in a, a, a separate um, Zoom, but it feels like um, it, it just underscored to me how, how far we still need to go. Um, anyway, I, I don't mean to get off on a tangent, but um, yeah, writing about the Civil War right now was just um, really interesting. It'll be interesting to see what people think about the book next spring. Hopefully, you know, COVID will be on the way out and we'll be on the other side of an election. So, you know, we'll see. That's certainly, um, you know, similar to the experience I've had with writing the last couple books. Um, and uh, that, you know, you just want to smack your head and say, why are we still, you know, why haven't we learned this lesson 170 years later, 200 years later? Why do we have to, you know, you, you think, that once would be enough, but um, I feel like there's so much I could say on this because it's one of the paradoxes, I think, of writing historical fiction. Um, interestingly, the book I'm working on now is set in world during World War II. It has to do with Japanese internment and it has to do with, um, you know, how Americans uh, really demonize the Japanese and Asians during that time. And as I was struggling to think, you know, how, well, not struggling, how you make this relevant? Because that's the challenge of every historical novel, I think is, but especially these ones where people think they know the outcome, you know, the Donner Party, the sinking of the Titanic. If, you, if readers think, well, I know that story, why do I have to read it? So I'm constantly challenged to think, well, how is this story relevant to what's going on today? And so it's, it's, um, it's a little disheartening in a way, but the pandemic is, I've decided that that's really sort of the model I'm going to use in this um, story about the spread of racism against the Japanese. You know, again, I, I don't write strictly historical fiction. I have, um, you know, a horror kind of element in the retelling. And so it is like a contagious disease in a way. I don't want to give away too much, but I've been able to draw on the pandemic for that. But overall, I'd like to take Jessica's uh, point and say, I don't think that it's going to be easy to write um, a, um, a story about what's going, what we're doing, what we're going through right now for a while, that we really are going to need to put some distance between us and the events to really understand what the significance is, possibly also because we're just going through so much. I mean, this is an incredibly turbulent time. You know, I was a political analyst for many, many years, and I saw you know, other events in past history, not in American history, that we can parallel what we're going through right now. And you just can't absorb all that and the pandemic, you know, in real time. And I think really be able to take away, to figure out, you know, what's the key? What's the, the, the thing at the bottom of it? When we get to that, I think it's gonna be pretty mind blowing, hopefully, to us as people um, to realize, uh, without sounding too mystical here, you know, that, that we're really going through an incredibly bad time and hopefully we're going to learn from it down the road. Well, it's, uh, 
just to kind of follow that a little bit, I, I was talking to an author yesterday and, and he's working on a story that's set in 2020 and he actually he said, I, I'm going in and doing a find and replace and 2020 is turning into 2024 because he needs, he wants to get, he thinks that's like the magic numbers. Four years from now, things might be back to normal. So just to throw it out to the, to the, the rest of the group, uh, when he says in four years, meaning like that's the safe spot, like we'll be way back to normal in four years. I think that's what he was going for. Um, but it, would anybody set something in 2020? Would, would you attempt a story set in 2020? Well, this doesn't really count, but so for a very long time, I had a long running series set partially during the Napoleonic Wars and partially about a present day grad student. It went back and forth between her researches and the crazy Napoleonic characters she was researching. And it was kind of madcap and silly and lighter and funnier than anything else I write. And I had not, I wound up that series back in 2015 with the 12th book in the series. And I haven't gone back to it since. And all of a sudden I heard this grad student starting to talk in my head again, except now she was my age and had two kids and was in lockdown in an apartment in London. And so I started to write what I was calling in my head pandemic pink carnation. Um, you know, this updated version of this character I had written for years. I think it's some, in some ways it was like the same way I've heard that cartoonists will draw things that are going on in their life to help them make sense of them. I used Eloise, this long young running character of mine, to try to contextualize what was going on with our lockdown. Whether that will ever become an actual book or see the light of day. I mean, just saying it makes my agent panic because she does not want me to go back to those books. But I found it was, it was cathartic writing in that voice, but in our current dilemma. So I don't know if that really counts at all since it's not really a for publication thing, unless I really talk around my agent, but it helped to write it in the midst of it. I feel like if I can fortify myself to do that work, I feel like there, there's so, it's this time right now is so, I, I hate to call it this, but when you look at it as a story, it's so ripe because it's so, so difficult. And as you were saying, Nina, we're, we're, we're forced together to lead these like totally di different lives um, than, than we've ever led. And I feel like I, absolutely. I don't know if I will ever be strong enough in my heart and soul to want to sit sit with this in the way that it would the, a good book would require. But I I know that people will, and I feel like really really great, powerful literature will will come of it, that will help people you know learn about themselves and the time they're living in, whether it's five years, ten years, eighty, and as well as like shed light on kind of our experience now. I can't wait to read those books. I just wanted to jump in and say, um, there's a book that's out right now called Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay, which is a, a kind of a pandemic book. People have been saying it's kind of prescient because, <laughs> you know, of course he wrote it like a year ago, year and a half ago. And yet there's some things about it that are just so today. That's kind of a little miracle, but I agree with you. I think probably the really good books that are going to look at this as a whole and really draw the big themes and, and uh, answer the big questions you know, going to take a little bit of time, but um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading those. And what is so interesting about that is that this is so worldwide that these stories are going to be coming from everywhere, you know, from every part of the world. And you just can't say that about most events. Um, this is one event that is so truly worldwide. I, sometimes I can't even wrap my head around it. Like I can't, you know, I, I have family that lives in Belgium and in England, and I think, really, they're going through this? I mean, I know they are because I have conversations with them, but it's so hard for me to really imagine that we are all going through this. It's just mind-blowing to me, and I think the literature that's going to come out of it just worldwide will be, will really be interesting to read. Luckily, I do far, I, I couldn't do it because I just couldn't dwell further in this time period that I have to actually live in it. Um, so I think I, I agree with what everyone's saying. Like it's, and like I said before, I, I, I'm kind of like staying away from it. The only thing that I'm thinking about possibly writing is that, so the same series that I, my, my novella is a part of, um, the creator, he said that he, or the publisher, he said that he's thinking about doing 
another one, um, another Rewind or Die series. And I was thinking, once again, because we're talking about the 80s and like, you know, that horror uh, genre, what's more 80s than like the the sequel that's not as good as the first one, you know, like a <laughs> sequel. And, but the way that like the first novella ends, it would have to take place in 2020, which is why I was saying I was thinking about setting something in 2020. But then I'd be like, that book is so fun. And then to put this over it, I was at first thinking there's no way I could do it. But then I thought this actually sets up a lot of problems for my characters. And I'm always looking for natural tension. And, I'm, and I was thinking, how would they get around this? How would they work around this? And then like something started to form in my head, but the only question I'm, I'm with now is, is that insensitive? But then I'm like, I don't know, like you said, there's gonna be so many different books that come from this. Um, and is it insensitive to use like this pandemic as like a, a layer of tension or something like that over, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a horror, so it's, it's gory and whatever, but it's also fun. But, you know, I'm kind of playing with that idea because there's so many things that could, could work in its favor, like everyone has to wear masks and stuff and like, you know, I don't know, all this kind of stuff. So, I don't know. It's just something I'm still toying with, but I'm not sure. I'm just so eager for the whole thing to be over. I don't know if I could dwell in it anymore. <laughs> um, it's bad enough writing about Nazis and, you know, all, you know, the other stuff. I, I'm ready to do, you know, be in a world that I actually enjoy being in. And uh, I just can't wait for it to be over, so. As a reader, I, I actually told Paul Tremblay who wrote Survivor's Song that I got a lot of reading done while trying to read his book because it really did spike a bunch of anxieties that were happening. It's a brilliant book and it's fantastic and it, it should be read, but it, it really, it's difficult to read through something that's similar to what we're going through right now. Um, and, and, uh, so, so my next question, somebody on a, on a panel yesterday said something that made me think of all of you and your work. Um, so he said, I don't want to, uh, and he writes fiction, um, and he said, I don't want any message or anything I was trying to say in my fiction to be buried under levels of allegory or metaphor. Um, and in that sp book specifically, he was talking about uh, police brutality, and he said, I wanted it so that Rodney King makes a cameo appearance in the book. Um, so speaking of history then as allegory, how do you know when it's okay to use a real historical figure to tell what is essentially, and at its heart, your story, your original story? Is, is, there, um, is there a line? And if so, where is that line? You want me to go first? This is one I've struggled with a lot. So um, my first three books were not tied to, a, to specific historical events. The history just wove in and out of these people's lives. Um, but in The Hunger, which was based on the story of the Donner Party and the Titanic, they are tied to specific historical events. However, I'm not trying to retell those stories. I'm sort of using them as a jumping off point to, to make other points and, and to, you know, uh, kind of highlight other things. So my, my thinking has evolved. I did the um, Donner Party story, The Hunger, and it's almost all almost all of the characters are people who, uh, it, you know, existed in real life. And I started to feel really bad about it because for the story that I wanted to tell, they had to do bad things that, um, you know, you can wiggle, you can go through the wiggle hole of time and say, well, maybe they did these bad things and there was just no record of it. But for the most part, I felt like, you know, I was, you know, was it bad enough? They were cannibals. I had to make them, you know, a drunk or two. So when I did <laughs> the Titanic, um, and that is, even though it's set on that historical event, it's not about that event, but I did think I would prefer to have more of the main characters, especially the ones that had to have, oh, let's say more baggage in their lives, um, be fictional characters. So now, you know, uh, the half or so of the main characters, because I always do multiple third person point of, point of view, um, you know, more than half of them are, are completely fictitious characters. And for the other ones, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm just rationalizing things in my head, you know, that sometimes I do have to project um, something on a character that there's no historical record of. But, you know, I try to look at what I know about the character and make a determination what kind of person are, are they 
are they probably? How would they react in a certain situation? What are their likely, you know, um, nature to be? And so I do try to keep to that. But yeah, I do feel badly about, you know, having to distort a real person's, um, you know, history. And you just really hope that readers don't think everything is, is completely true to life. Nina, I'm wondering you specifically writing writing nonfiction. I mean, uh, with that that question in mind, but also, do you ever find yourself having to reconstruct or kind of make not make up obviously conversations, but but you have to get into the heads of people who are, have been dead for a hundred years. You know, how yeah. how do you how do you create a conversation that they likely had without knowing what they actually said? Yeah. Um, well, in my book. Um, the Lowell's of Massachusetts, which follows the Lowell's fa Lowell family over 300 years, um, I did have um, thoughts and conversations that were lar largely based on letters and journal entries. Um, but I didn't feel entirely comfortable doing that because I write nonfiction. Um, and so in my latest book, American Rebels, there is no, there's no um, con no sentence that does not come from a recorded, you know, recorded evidence that so-and-so said that or wrote that in a letter. I mean, it is, it's so firmly grounded. And as much as I would love to add some words <laughs> to what some of them said or get deeper and, you know, I, I can, I can offer my own thoughts on what they were thinking, but with nonfiction, I think it's just really important when you're writing nonfiction that you, that you have the facts. And it means um, footnote, 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 footnote to back everything up so that you can say to someone who says, well, how do you know it was sunny on such and such a day? Well, I know because I actually have, you know, three different people talking about the weather in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1721. So I'm going to take that as evidence, but I'm not going to make up a day of bad weather or good weather if it wasn't there. It's, I can't. Um, and that's why I'm constantly thinking I would love to write mysteries set in like early 1700s um, New England and just let, let have it, like get rid of the Mathers. They, you know, they were bad guys. I'm going to punish them. And I mean, I think I would really enjoy that. So um, I see there's something really wonderful you can do in historical fiction. You can get rid of the people you want to get rid of. You can malign them if you want. You know, you can get your revenge, and uh, and that might be really fun to do. And, uh, Kelly Joe, I'd actually I'd want to ask you because you you take a bit of a t different approach in Crooked Hallelujah. Um, so in your book, you're examining very personal histories against the larger backdrop of a shared cultural history. Can you talk about how you, can, you blend those to tell the story that you tell? Uh, sure. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's really a personal story for me. So I, I don't think that I was thinking about the larger backdrop of history, really. Although um, I do think that, you know, readers can, can, can take that away from from the book you, you know things like the role of christianity and forced assimilation of native people in this country the role of boarding schools doing the same um, and you see the younger generations of women become more removed from their language and some cultural traditions um, so i think that's there but it was really only a natural result of that being i guess what i think of the lived experience of of the characters, if that makes sense. Um, I think the characters were, were born of lived experiences of, of a lot of people, you know? That, and so, so I think it's there, but it wasn't really something that I, I set out to do. Um, yeah. And, and for Lauren and Martha, you guys both tell kind of sweeping epic stories of history. Can I ask what, what kind of, what draws you to those bigger stories? Well, for me, they were stories that um, are, are true stories that I'm telling. And um, for example, with the Civil War book, uh, Caroline Faraday had kept all of her family's uh, Civil War letters. So really, I mean, that was the challenge in that book was to, to kind of, um, take those letters and turn that into 
um, a story, you know, it could have gotten boring really quickly. So I think the big challenge was to make it, you know, really interesting. But, um, but, but yeah, for each of the books of those three books, um, I've had letters and family history to go by. So that really, uh, that helps a lot. Um, this fourth book is um, completely different. I don't, it's not that same family, so I don't have that roadmap anymore. So um, it, it actually is a lot, um, a lot easier in a way, but harder because you don't have the roadmap, but you don't um, have to feel like um, what you're saying about um, if the weather, if it wasn't raining on that day, um, it doesn't really matter. So you have freedom to. And my experience was almost exactly the flip side of Martha's. Um, I grew up on the great sweeping epics of the 80s. I was as a 10-year-old you know, reading The Thorn Birds and Carlene Cohen's Through a Glass Darkly and um, MMK's Sweeping Colonial Epics. And I desperately wanted to write books like those that intersected with real historical events that made you feel like you were living through these historical events, but always had fictional characters at their core. And so for most of my career, and this book I just finished is my 21st book, the, the 20 books that preceded it have been inspired in many cases by real events and real people, but they've always been 75% fictional. Um, that they're really pastiches, where I have drawn bits and pe pieces from different people's lives and smushed them together in a sort of weird Dr. Frankenstein way to create my own creations. Bizarrely, though, this last book I just wrote about the Smith College Relief Unit is the closest I've ever come to writing biographical fiction. And it's exactly what Martha was just describing about her earlier books, where I had such an insanely rich historical record. I had over 2,000 pages of material from the archives in Smith letters these women, these real women had sent home. And there was just so much there. The roadmap was there in a way it's never been for me before. And I found it in its own way really, really hard. Figuring out what to pick, what to leave, how to fictionalize enough that I wasn't totally stealing these women's identities, but to keep enough in to give the real flavor of their experience. And in some ways I cheated. Um, instead of writing real biographical fiction, I changed all the names. And a couple of the characters are truly my creations. Some are just really thinly veiled versions of themselves, but I had to change the names because I didn't want to offend their families. Um, and, but it was, I found it incredibly hard dealing with such a rich corpus of material because you feel like you owe a debt to those people. And just like Nina was saying, you have to really make sure whether it rained or not. Mm -hmm. and, and Jessica, so as opposed to um, like historical, watershed historical moments at Cirque Berserk, you touch on cultural touchstones like songs from the 80s that really root the reader in the time. And I thought especially just the opening where I, the two songs you picked, Take On Me and, and the Whitney Houston song, I mean, it, they just, the first time I read the book, you just can't get the songs out of your head, but they, they put the, you in the place. So I'm wondering just kind of how, how did you go about choosing which cultural touchstones to set the book in, in, in the 80s? Well, um, I think 80s music just has this, it carries over with it, this nostalgia that we all have. Like he said, like once you, just reading the title puts you in like a, a certain frame of mind. Like it, it's like a feeling kind of thing. Um, and I kind of, I'm working from a disadvantage because I was born 1990, like I'm 29 <laughs> years old. So I was not in the 80s, even though I grew up on John Hughes movies and, you know, like I said, all the slashers from the 80s and I can watch them until I'm blue in the face and like, um, you know, read as much as I can and do as much research. But I was going for a feeling more so um, with Cirque du Cirque. I was going for that feeling of, being in a carnival, like being being scared in a carnival, being, but also like having the fun, what I think of the fun kind of stuff in the 80s, like the the synth and the 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 way people dressed and like, you know, I think of Teen Witch where she like wears this weird tutu, like the fashion, that kind of stuff. So I was going for that. And like one of the things to put me in that mindset was to listen to music. I like made a playlist. And then also, 
I used the the song titles for you know the the parts that I separated the book or the novella into, but they were also the themes of those uh, those sections, right? So, you know, I want to dance with somebody. That section, everyone, almost every character in that section is like pining for someone. You know, they want to love someone. Rhythm of the night, that's when you figure out what the whole theme is of this entire book, right? And it goes on and on from there. So I was working with creating an atmosphere with the with the song titles. And I was also working with like trying to go for a feeling. So yeah. And uh, just the the point of research and, and as we kind of wrap up here, I'm interested in in research and and each of your approaches to research. Um, I guess, but since I started working in a library, the, the misconception, everyone, all of my friends say, oh, you must just read all day. And the same to you guys, you must all love research if you write, you write about the past, right? So <laughs> my question is, do you like research? But uh, and, and where is that balance of like getting lost in the research and how do you avoid making the research the work where the writing should be the work? You want me to get started because you want to pick a fight. You know what my answer is going to be to this. <laughs> I'm often on the other side of the fence from historians. But in my defense, I'll say, I'm a professional researcher. This is what I did at Intelligence for 35 years. I was a senior researcher for the RAND Corporation, and I ran a research lab for the Defense Department. So I'm not a stranger to research. I don't like getting lost in the research. Because, um, you know, I know research paralysis is real. I've had to kick the butts of many junior researchers up and down the aisle to get them to move. Um, so I try to be very efficient because, you know, I am afraid of just, you know, being lost in it for years. With something like the Titanic, I mean, the, the Donner Party was bad enough. That was uh, what I consider a complex historical event because it was tied specific time and place, right? They were going across a landscape uh, uh, set against a timeline that I could not deviate from. There were a hundred people in the wagon party. And then you go move on to something like the Titanic, which, you know, I didn't think twice about writing about the Donner Party. I actually did take a little pause before, I, do I really want to write about the Titanic? Because that was what, 23, 2400 people. It was also a complex event because it was also tied, tied to spots in the ocean. And, you know, a lot of stuff. And it has legions of fans who are rabid about the Titanic and are just waiting for you to get something wrong. Um, but I decided to give it a try anyway. But like I said, I'm, I'm, I know I'm an outlier when it comes to most people who like to write historical fiction. And I would say in my defense, it's probably because I don't think of myself as a historical fiction writer. I'm writing a story. It's, it has, you know, it, a, history is a frame, but it is not about that historical event. A lot of people gasp when I tell them that I actually do most of my research in two weeks. I'm, I'm very, very <laughs> regimented. I think about the story. I think about where my deepest gaps are and like what's important to the story and what do I know the least about. So I'll do a quick research uh, literature scan. I'll pick two books that uh, for my primary research that will address those gaps. I'll, I'll research that. Um, ridiculously scrupulously. I do all my note taking in um, spreadsheets. I don't use paper at all. And, um, but I do a lot of spot research as I'm writing. Because for me, the story really does come first and the history sort of fills it in. And I'll stop here and, and everyone shall disagree with me. <laughs> I'll hop in because I don't. I, I just, I spot research too. Like I, I think it's really, it's, it's a lovely day when I get lost in research, um, like details about like, would it be common for a, um, a cassette player in an early 90s sedan to be able to play the radio while you're rewinding? Like questions like that. But those are the, that, that is my historical research, you know, for this book. That's, that's the kind of stuff I was looking at. Um, but it, I find it really fun and a nice, you know, it, I, I couldn't do two weeks of that. So it's really nice to spend, you know, a few hours or in some cases a, a day or two on those sorts of questions and then just get right back into it. I have to admit, I find spot research part of the, one of the most frustrating things about writing for me. I do it the other way around. I do what I call an immersion period first, where before I start a book, I spend a couple of months just reading. 
not even taking notes, just reading everything I can find about anything connected to the time period, period or any of the topics in the books. You know, monographs, biographies, letters, novels written during the period to get the tone of the voice. And I find that my characters and my story grow out of that, that sometimes whatever my original idea was will change dramatically based on this emergent period, because then the characters and the events spool naturally out of the research I'm doing. But of course, it's impossible to anticipate everything. And so for me, that those beginning few months are entirely about the research and the immersion. And then I move entirely into the character phase where I'm in their heads and I am very character driven. I am driven by their thoughts and their emotions. And when I have to stop and think, drat, was it raining in the Psalm on September 21st? And I go hunt that down, it throws me out of their emotions. And I deeply resent that. Because you know those rabbit holes are always the things like the cassette player that you think will take you two minutes. And then five hours later, you are Googling frantically or you're looking at this pile of books that's next to your chair where you were sure you knew where something was, except your little sticky notes are all in the wrong place. And so that I find incredibly frustrating because I just, at that point, I just want to be with my people and see where they're going. Well, since I write nonfiction, I mean, I spend two years doing the research um, and keeping really, uh, and, and amassing so much more in research than I'm ever going to use, and then I have to cut it down, and then it's about a year of writing. Um, where I better know where all my research is. And, um, and I'm very old school. It's all in marble notebooks and on note cards and on poster boards that I put note cards on. But I know where everything is. Once I start writing, I know where everything is and I know where everything's going. It took me 10 years to write my first book. So I, I um, was not super efficient. On, um, but on the other hand, I feel like once I had that, uh, kind of knowledge base. I didn't really have to go back and do much spot research because it was all kind of like I, I had been there myself and done it. Um, now I, I've gotten much better at it. And I really try and find hidden history um, to make the period more interesting because Civil War, for example, I feel like so many people have written Civil War books and there are people that really know the Civil War way more than I do. But what I was looking for was kind of mining for those little things that uh, made, um, made it fun for me. If I, if I didn't know about something um, that I th and I thought it was kind of weird or uh, interesting, then that was my sign that I could, I could put it in. Well, and then just the last question as we wrap up, we can go around the horn. Uh, I think the beauty of StoryFest uh, is that it, it's, it celebrates all genres, and I think it introduces readers to books that maybe they wouldn't have met otherwise. So if you all could do, uh, talk about uh, one of your books that you'd love to, to introduce readers to, and then maybe a book in a different genre that you're reading currently that, that, that you'd like to talk about. Um, and then finally, just shout out a local bookstore if you want, because boy, do we know local bookstores need our help, right? So whoever wants to start. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll shout out my book one more time, The Deep. Um, and the book I'm going to shout out is not what I'm reading now, but um, you know, I always thought it would be fun to like do an event with a historian who really knew, you know, the event, uh, the period that I was working on. And I got the opportunity to do it this time around. A book came out called The Ship of Dreams by Gareth Russell. And it's about the Titanic. And you think, you know, do we need another book about the Titanic? But he did a brilliant job where he focused on six characters who he thought were kind of emblematic of certain aspects of the era. And what I enjoyed the most about his books were, was he found all these little things that I could not find anywhere. Well, you know, I set up myself, right? I do two weeks. He spent two years researching this thing. That's what you can do when you spend the time. But it was just fascinating. So we actually got a, a chance to do an event together on Zoom. That's one of the good things that came out of the pandemic, right? You didn't have to physically be in the same spot. He was in Ireland. I was in, um, in the D.C. area. And we had the best time. I mean, it was just 
you can even catch it on on the line it's it's somewhere but um i really highly recommend that by the way ladies if you ever get the opportunity anyway ship of dreams by gareth russell if you like the titanic you cannot not read this book it's absolutely fabulous oh and my shout out would be there's so many um uh one more page books in arlington virginia they are so supportive of all of the writers in the dc area um just I'm writing that down. <laughs> oh my gosh. Lauren, you want to go? Um, sure. Okay. I will shout out my most recent book, The Summer Country, which is, I mean, it is the most historical thing I've ever written. And the closest to what I thought I was going to write when I wanted to be a writer as a small child, that big sweeping epic. Um, it's set in colonial Barbados and ranges from the 18 teens through the 1850s and covers a rising of enslaved people and a cholera epidemic. So if you want perspective on pandemics, go experience a little cholera in 1854 Barbados. And they do get through it eventually, you know, so that's upbeat. Um, for someone else's book, so like many other people, I've been having a lot of trouble reading what I would usually read during the pandemic. It's very hard to focus. Mostly I've been reading mid-century British mysteries because it's really reassuring knowing that the knitting spinster will always solve the crime. Even, you know, in times of turmoil, there's that, that's constant. And there's always tea at the vicarage and someone trying to bump someone off at the manor house for their inheritance. But the one thing I've been able to read that wasn't a mid-century British mystery novel was Jody Taylor's St. Mary's series. The first one is called One Damn Thing After Another. It's what if historians were able to go back in time, not to change anything, but to actually look in on historical events and record them. These books are snarky and hilarious and so cleverly written. And for history buffs with a wacky sense of humor, I absolutely recommend, especially that first book, One Damn Thing After Another. Um, I think she describes her historians as crazed, tea sodden disaster magnets. And, you know, it's basically what every grad student really wishes their experience could have been, as opposed to seeing in the archives with footnotes. Um, as for a bookstore, there are so many indies I love, but I'm going to shout out to um, my own little local mom and pop shop in Cold Spring, New York. It's a shop that was just opened um, and the, the town had not had a bookstore for a decade. And so I desperately would like this bookstore to stay alive. It's Split Rock Books, and they are an adorable, adorable shop run by an adorable couple who has a really adorable small child. And everyone should order lots of books from them and keep them in business. Great. Martha? Wow. Well, I was just in Cold Spring, by the way. That's the cutest town. Um, it's so my happy place. It, it's ador adorable. Um, my book, I guess I should show, um, I, we just did a cover reveal from my third book, the, um, the um, Civil War book, it's called Sunflower Sisters. So that is my book that I wanted to show everybody. Um, oh, that cover, it took a long time, but uh, it, was, it was fun. Anyway, um, another book, I figure um, the, the only book that's here on my desk, I, I could talk about that one, it's called The Emotional Craft of Fiction. It's so good. And I always judge uh, books by how much I write in them. I know that's a sacrilege, but you know, you can see that I really enjoyed it. But it really, um, I love writing books. Um, I never studied writing in school. So I guess this is kind of my um, MFA in a way. But um, it's just really, it, just a really good writing book. Sometimes I feel like when I read a writing book that, you know, it's kind of a rehash of everything that I read before. Uh, but this one is by Donald Moss, and I think he's an agent. Um, he's just really, really great advice. And then um, the bookstore I love is the Hickory Stick. I live in Litchfield, Connecticut, and the Hickory Stick is in Washington, Connecticut. And they have just been so good during the pandemic. They do a drive-through for people for their books, and they're just super creative about um, continuing to be a successful independent bookstore during the pandemic. So shout out to the Hickory Stick. And Kelly Jo. So my book is Crooked Hallelujah and it follows a Cherokee mother and daughter as they move from um, 
the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma to North Texas um, looking for a better life. It, it happens to happen during the oil bust of the 80s. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a book about mothers and daughters. And it's also very much a book about faith and belief and what living in kind of a fundamentalist Christian household can do, how you can carry that with you. And um, it, it sort of saves some characters and, and for others, it, it, it perhaps haunts them um, as they live their lives. Um, that's my book. Um, a book that um, I think is really great, that's a, a different, somewhat different genre, is a book called Winter Counts by David Heska Wombly Wyden. Um, and it, it takes place on the Rosebud Reservation. It's kind of a literary crime book, um, but it's really great. And it is out, I think, at the end of this month. So that's an exciting one on the horizon. Um, local bookstores in Richmond, Virginia. Um, there are two of them that have been really, really wonderful. It's Chop Suey Books in Carytown, And then in the Shaco Slip, we've got Fountain Bookstore. And they're just really doing, being creative and supporting authors and, and keeping books in readers' hands. They're really wonderful and I'm appreciative to them. Jessica? Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and put up my book, Zerk the Zerk, um, and it's a horror slasher. There's some blood, there's some love, there's a lot of 80s stuff in there, but basically some teens decide on their senior night that going to the amusement park wasn't fun enough, so they visit an abandoned carnival, and then, of course, chaos ensues. Um, but I've, I'm, I'm actually reading two books right now. I'm reading The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, and I'm nearly done, and it's so good, um, but that's all the way in my room, and I didn't feel like going all the way and getting it. And I'm also reading, um, oh, I don't know if you can see it, sorry, My Brilliant Friends. Uh. Um, my best friend actually told me to read this. Uh, she watched, there's an HBO thing of it, so she watched it, and then she went back and she read all of the books. And she wanted me to read them because she was like, oh my God, it reminds us, it reminds me of us and our friendship a little bit. And I was like, it's two Italian girls in the 50s. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, but, but no, I'm reading it and it's really, really interesting. It's like I said, the, the story, it's, it goes over four books, I believe. And it spans from the 1950s in Naples, Italy, uh, to about, I think, 2012 or 2013, something somewhere around there. And it's basically the friendship of these two girls and how they um, basically get out of poverty, get out of, you know, the expectations of their families, um, and also their own very complicated and complex and great, but then also very tragic kind of friendship. So... That's what I'm reading right now. And um, the bookstore, uh, I don't know if anyone will ever be in Lauder Hill, Florida, for whatever reason, um, but um, uh, there's this mall called Lauder Hill Mall, and in there, there's a store called Vico, and they sell a lot of, like, Lauder Hill's just a Caribbean place, so it's a lot of Caribbean uh, merchandise, like, you know, whatever you might expect, but also they have um, books by Caribbean author authors and, like, historical stuff in there, so... Um, I'd probably, I'd shout them out. Yeah. And Nina. Um, well, I, I have to talk about my, this is my arc of the book, American Rebels. Um, and I'm talking about it because it came out in March, which was a really bad time for a book to come out. Um, <laughs> in that, you know, I didn't go to any bookstores. Um, I didn't go to any, uh, you know, um, weekends where, uh, where people talk about books and talk about my book. I did luckily get to do an event with the Westport Library and I loved that so much and it was a great evening. But then when it was over, you know, I had to go and cook dinner, <laughs> which doesn't usually happen after a book event. I go out to dinner, I have drinks with my friend. So American Rebels, how the Hancock, Adams and Quincy families found the flames of revolution and it follows um, the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy families who all pretty much grew up in the same village of Braintree. And that fascinated me when I found that out, um, both men and women. Um, so like Abigail Adams, yes, she was from Weymouth, but she spent most of her childhood in Braintree because she liked hanging out with her grandmother because her grandmother really loved her and her energy. 
Um, and I look at how their upbringing really um, set the path for them to become leaders of the, of the fight for, um, for, col for colonial rights. And um, it goes all the way up to the Declaration of Independence and touches on so many issues that we are struggling with. I mean, certainly pandemics, because they, had, they lived through, uh, through a number of smallpox um, epidemics, but also just issues of you know, how we are governed, what voice we have in our government, how our courts operate, how our police operate, what accountability our police have. Um, and all of those issues led the American colonists to rebel. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> Is that a premonition? We'll see. Um, and as far as what I'm reading, I'm reading tons of mysteries because that's basically what I can handle. Um, but I did read Julia Alvarez's new book called Afterlife. And I really, really loved it. And it's such a slender book. Um, and I need to read it again. I read it so quickly because it's just so beautiful and so compelling, but I want to reread it. And it's about a woman who's a little bit older than me, who's trying to figure out her next stage in life. Her, her husband's died. Um, and then something really terrible happens to one of her sisters. And I went through something similar to that. It just, there were so many um, things that, that really resonated with me. A beautiful, beautiful book. And I just love when I can find just a piece of perfect little short fiction that takes you away. Um, so, yep, Julia Alvarez, Afterlife. Any bookstore shout out? Oh, Elm Street Books. Thank you, in New Canaan and RJ Julia in Madison, Connecticut. And I'm going to go up to Washington and go to the bookstore that you recommended because I'm always looking for new bookstores and that would be a nice day trip for me to do. So thank you. <laughs> and, and go get um, uh, ice cream at, in Bantam. You'll see the line. There's like a million tourists there. It's okay. a fun day. Okay, okay, definitely. definitely. I love Arethusa that's up. Yes, yes, that's, I couldn't remember. That's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, Phantom, I'm going. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Write that down. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us so much. Really, just such an honor to talk to you all. This was great. And to everybody watching, thank you for watching and support authors, support indie bookstores, and support libraries. And check out more of our StoryFest stuff because there's plenty of it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this panel, head over to our StoryFest 2020 playlist and check out the rest of our virtual author events. And for more information about StoryFest, visit the library's website at www.westportlibrary.org.